Thank you um, for participating today. Uh, this is our fourth webinar in the series, and it is being the it is on the ocean carbon uptake in the CMIP-5 models working group, which is a joint working group between U.S. CLIVAR and the Ocean Carbon Biogeochemistry Program. It was started in 2012, and the three co-chairs are Annalisa Bracco, Curtis Deutsch, and Taki Ito. Annalisa Bracco is from Georgia Tech University, and she will be presenting today. And I will go ahead and hand it over to her. Okay. Thanks a lot for being here. And um, uh, my goal today is to give you an overview of what we have done in the three years that the working group was active. We ended our activities in March, I guess. Um, the working group was started in uh, 2012. The working group are listed in the second slide. So Chris, Taka, and we have Donny, John Dunn, Marcus Yorko, Nicola Wendowski, uh, Galen McKinley, Ralph Miller, and uh, Shantin Fier, um, and Jamie Pauter from Canada, from McGill University, um, that was the international member. We had a second member, but then for family, uh, second international member, but for family reason, he had to drop off. Um, the group has been quite active, and uh, the uh, activity that we promoted or we organized are listed here. So the, I think the, the main activity that we led was the summer colloquium that we had at ANCAR in, between July and August in 2013. Uh, the summer colloquium was on the carbon climate connection in the Hertz system. And in the middle of it, we had a week of a research workshop titled Key Uncertainties in the Global Carbon Cycle Perspectives Across the Rest Terrestrial and Ocean Ecosystems. And um, both activities in my mind were extremely successful. Um, we had uh, 25 graduate students, they were extremely active and worked very hard through the three weeks. And over 60 scientists that got together in uh, during week two for the workshop. And we were able to put together the community, um, the carbon cycling community, both on the land and ocean side, and really try to merge those two, discussing where we have uh, research topics in common and um, what we should do to improve both areas in the near future. And so a number of recommendations came out from uh, the workshop and they were summarized in two articles that we brought for EOS that came out uh, immediately after the workshop in 2013 and then a longer article for BAM that um, is still impressed because of the BAM's time, um, but was accepted uh, this past January. And I will summarize the um, recommendation that came out from the workshop uh, later on. Uh, in addition to this, we contributed um, to the U.S. Clara Science Plan in 2013. Uh, later this year, earlier this year, we contributed to the CIMIC 6 planning, and I will also summarize the recommendation for that. And uh, to conclude our activities, we had a workshop in uh, San Francisco just before, the weekend before AGU, together with the Thunder Ocean Working Group. And um, the um, report is in the final stages of preparation. The results from the workshop um, were also summarized in the issues of climate variation and OCB newsletter that came out in May. And I will also, um, the articles, the, the five articles that made the, uh, the issue are really a sum of the recommendation that um, was put together by the working group 
as of which research we would like to see done in the next five years in relation to ocean carbon cycling. So this is just a photo of the participant in the FEMA colloquium. Um, we had an incredibly large number of qualified applicants. We had over 120 applicants, uh, which was in a way surprising. Um, we didn't expect such a big pool. And so we were really able to select 25 top students. And we had 17 lectures and uh, six group projects that were presented at Anchor at the end of the school. And uh, at least one of them uh, had continued um, towards the publication with Matt Long being one of the uh, advisors uh, for the group. There were definitely two that were worth the publication, but I think that the, the group of the second project uh, was not able to get together at the end of the school to continue. Um, the workshop was sponsored by U.S. Cliver, OCB, and we also got uh, funding from CCIWG to uh, USDA we brought the proposal and we were funded. Uh, we had over 60 participants. We also had to make a selection on the participants because we had more applicants that we could accommodate. And the objective uh, was to explore what are the key uncertainties in her system model representation of the global carbon cycle, both from the ocean and from the land um, perspective, community. And um, as I said, we summarize outcomes and recommendation in those two articles, and we uh, organize the workshop around five topics, global carbon cycle control, mechanisms that regulate nuclear cycling and impact, remineralization pathways, import, very important both on the ocean and on the land side, and, and in both cases very fully represented in models. Um, the role of individuals in ecosystem dynamics and then observational data that may constrain um, carbon cycle feedback. The recommendations um, that were put forward are organized in six topics. Uh, first of all, we recommended that um, a transdisciplinary initiative should be started between terrestrial and ocean scientists to study respiration pathways because there are a lot of commonalities um, both over land and in the ocean. And the kind of problems and the kind of modeling tools and parameterization that we need um, are relatively similar conceptually. And so um, an initiative that puts the two communities together would be beneficial. We also um, put forward uh, the need for more observational studies of the mechanisms that control nutrient budgets. And uh, uh, we hope for a better synergy between modelers and experimentalists to constrain model formulation to manipulation experiments. Uh, one of the issues that uh, came out and will come out later again uh, when we evaluated CIMIT 5 models is the fact that physiological traits are really poor, uh, poorly defined in models, almost non-existent, and we need a tighter collaboration between physiologists and modelers to account for them, because it would be the only way we will be able to model evolution and adaptation in those models. Um, there are also, especially for the marine ecosystem components, large uncertainties in the trophic coupling, and so how this control phytoplankton biomass and exports. Uh, the parameterizations are very rudimentary, and um, they behave dramatically differently for very subtle parameter changes. Therefore, we do need to improve the data constraint that we have for grazing parameterization through target observational efforts. And this is particularly important for the ocean side. Um, we also argue that we should have evaluation of ecosystem models done using a hierarchy of models and different physical settings, because this would be the only way to gain insight on the feedbacks between physical and ecological processes. And this is not done easily um, in the 
kind of scenic framework that um, we used to work now, more recently, at least. And then, and it's sometimes difficult to get funding for these kind of studies. And then, um, and this also something something that will come up uh, later again. We need modularity that permits the swapping um, of process level parameterization, um, and we need models that allow this. Um, simplified models, for example, um, may use different parameterization for different models, and we cannot disentangle um, to the output what is the role of the parameterization and the differences between them. In the um, recommendation, in the, uh, the contribution to the U.S. Cliver Science Plan, uh, felt under the research um, challenges in Section 5.4, and we contributed to the climate and marine carbon biogeochemistry discussion that is summarized um, in this slide. Um, we discussed both the marine ecosystem and the carbon cycling components, and the sound of ocean uh, separately given um, all the activities um, that are specific uh, to the sound of ocean that are ongoing, both with the annual Cliver and OCB, with the other working group, and with the large SOCOM project that just started. And um, in putting forward uh, future research and needs, we noticed that we need multipurpose and integrated ocean observing networks. Uh, something is moving in that direction. Stockholm is the best example. Uh, from the Canadian perspective, we also have vocals for um, the Labrador Sea, where we are going to have at least one year of observations of the um, gas exchange component out there. Um, we need to continue innovating um, oceanographic instrumentation. We need integrated ecosystem process studies, and um, we, of course, need to continue and improve the uh, couple physical and biogeochemical models. Um, the recommendation from uh, to CIMIT 6 that uh, came out from a discussion uh, to the members of the working group earlier this year um, we recognize that of the proposed MIPs that are related to the ocean carbon cycle, at least the ones that were available in January, three are the most relevant, C4 MIP, O MIP, and OC MIP. Um, we recognize that given the very large number of MIP uh, experiments proposed, it will not be possible to have them all in place. And given that OMIP has already um, a pretty substantial convergence of groups willing to do it, um, building on the core experiment, um, we recognize that it would be perfectly fine to combine OMIP and OCMIP. Um, one of the things to notice is that investi investigating the ocean carbon cycle is still a necessary investment. Uh, because the contribution of the ocean to CO2 absorption globally seems to be pretty well constrained by the model, um, more so than the land component, for example, um, there is the general impression that there is little limited interest in this, this part, essentially, that, that some of the model community thinks that that is a solved problem. Um, in reality, we are still uh, limited by the very large uncertainties um, when it comes to understand the mechanism for the uptake, and especially the original distribution um, of the uptake. And I will show uh, towards the end um, what I mean by this, uh, but essentially, models give a global average that is very similar but for very different reasons and we don't understand why um, their distribution of present and future carbon uptake um, are, are very different, even if then when you average them together you pretty much get the same number. And so we still need to understand um, what is behind this number on which they seem to agree more or less. 
Um, one very important component um, identi identified by the working group is the need for passive tracer experiments. Uh, this will really help solving some of the questions raised when you try to investigate the regional distribution. So we, we really strongly support and recommend the, uh, the running of C CFCs and SFCs in uh, OMIS experiments, SF6 in uh, OMIS uh, experiments. Um, there was a pretty substantial discussion over lunch at the workshop in San Francisco uh, for, between people in the working group's interest in this specific aspect, and we recognize that doing it in the OMIS experiments, um, it's pretty straightforward for the uh, passive tracer um, it's not as easy for the carbon and biogeochemistry component because we need to take into account the temporal constraint of the omit. Um, but it was suggested that it, could, it would be possible using the pre-industrial spin-up from the seed for mix control to have the distribution of, of carbon and biogeochemistry in pre-industrial condition and then do the um, more recent time scales that are the one where OMIP is going to concentrate um, also with the biogeochemistry. And of course, the, the relevance of those experiments is to be able to compare CFCs or SF6 and carbon and see where things, uh, where the biology matters essentially and why. Um, the workshop that was held in San Francisco was joined with the Sunday Russian Working Group, and um, it was the, um, the goals of the workshop were essentially to um, discuss new metrics for evaluating biases in CIMIC-5 simulation in relation to both carbon and heat uptake, estimate uncertainties in model projections of heat and carbon uptake, and also inform our future observation model development and analysis strategies for addressing those biases and uncertainty. This included the protocol for CIMIC-6, and in fact, this was one of the discussions that we had in a group of about 10 people over lunch, and that ended up in the recommendations of CIMIC-6. The um, report is in progress and is organized around the four teams that were discussed at the workshop. Model biases and uncertainties in CIMIC-5, observational gaps and uncertainties, what are the process studies that we need, and this includes also measurements and parameterization, and then Southern Ocean, a specific focus on the Southern Ocean circulation and carbon cycle, um, given the um, beginning the, the, of the Falcon project. And um, finally, we had just uh, a month ago, less than a month ago, um, contributed to the U.S. Cliver Variations and OCD newsletter. Uh, we have five contributions plus an introduction, and uh, the contributions were based on the workshop, uh, workshop presentation um, with the specific goal of giving recommendation that um, resulted from the three year of the working group. The first contribution is from John Doon and um, Charlotte Lauthofer and Thomas Froliker. And uh, it's a summary of the ocean biogeochemistry challenges and needs in uh, CIMIC 5. Um, the plot here shows uh, the little agreement that there is in relation to the processes that generate the regional structure in projected changes. Um, and this is where I was, uh, what I was mentioning earlier. Those models tend to agree on the global carbon uptake, but they don't agree on the why, and they don't agree on the where either. Um, so you can see, for example, the um, relative um, change in uh, um, nitrogen limitation or um, the relative change in temperature limitation um, those are very different on light. They are very different between across models. And often with opposite sign in terms, for example, if you compare um, 
where the model is trained in terms of temperature versus where they stand in terms of nutrient limitation. Um, and this is for nine models. Not all the models, not all the ESM in the um, um, CIMIT side have the same output and allow you to calculate um, those quantities. So the challenge, um, that the first one that is the most obvious, is that not only the models don't have uh, the same outputs, and this is probably going to continue since CIMIT 6 as well. We don't have a lot of hope for that. But they don't even give a full documentation for the parameter values that are used. So when you're trying to figure out why the nutrient limitation, for example, is completely opposite between two different models, you don't have some of the parameters that were used for the simulations available. So the first recommendation is to really include an updated list of parameter values in order to be able to participate in the NEEP experiment. More generally, we need um, multi-member ensemble for detection and attribution, and we need long integration. And at least in size, we did not have any of those um, for the carbon component. We also need idealized sensitivity experiments, and uh, we don't have any kind of assessment so far available for the potential for predictability in terms of uh, carbon uptake. Um, we don't have an experimental um, biogeochemistry prediction, and of course we are still challenged by resolution because the fact that um, the biogeochemistry, for example, in the Southern Ocean is uh, heavily impacted by mesoscale eddies and that we're not resolving yet mesoscale eddies in, in a couple of system models uh, remains a, a large uncertainty. Um, in, in terms of recommendation, uh, it is recommended to run sensitivity of uh, physiological responses to temperature, acidification, oxygen, macro and micronutrient limitation. Uh, these go back to the uh, physiology uh, recommendation that came out also from the uh, workshop in uh, Boulder. Combine multi strength responses, and it's also recommended that the models that will participate in the CIMIT uh, 4, uh, the um, C4 MEEP, the carbon MEEP will run with consistent representation of aerosol, iron, CH4, and nitrogen cycles. And some kind of control of the ecosystem parameterization across the models. This was not done for the size. The uh, second contribution was by Natasha Romano and John Marshall and was in related to ocean heat and carbon uptake in transit climate change. And uh, the goal uh, of this um, presentation is to um, try to attribute to a specific process the uh, major contribution to uh, ocean heat and carbon uptake, and specifically to the AMOC. So essentially what the authors are arguing for is that the AMOC controls the trends in um, ocean heat uptake by regulating deep ocean ventilation. So the depth of the AMOC sets the depth to which ET is sequestered, uh, pretty much in the model. And therefore, the spread in ET and also carbon uptake across CIMIC 5 could be understood and explained by differences in their AMOC properties. Of course, models are not great at representing AMOC. For example, the Labrador Sea branch is very poorly represented. So we need the core-like experiments that can help at reducing the regional warming patterns a little bit better. So the main challenge that they identify is to quantify the contribution of the ocean component to the uncertainties in the climate change projection. So it's a pretty big challenge that really focus on the physics. And the recommendation is uh, another meet that was not um, in the initial list that was presented in January. This is the Flux Anomaly Force Model Intercomparison Project. And um, the idea is to run existing um, couple control runs with Earthy Flux overrides. 
So wind stress, evaporation, precipitation, and heat fluxes will be uh, prescribed and will overrun the, um, the one from the couple control run. So essentially, it's a flux correction with prescribed fluxes, and those will be chosen to be representative of the fluxes induced by climate change. And the idea is to run all the ocean components with the same fluxes and see what are the difference in the responses. Um, the third contribution focused on the tropics and was by Pedro Di Nessio, uh, Leticia Barbero, Matthew Long, Nikki Lewandowski, and Clara Bezet. And um, the, the question here is really, can we attribute uh, the tropical ocean carbon variability um, to anthropogenic changes versus specific decadal variability. So the, the problem um, that they try to address is to try to reconcile the nearly zero trend in um, delta T CO2 uh, in the tropical Pacific uh, with the projection of a robust decrease in that we actually find in the five models. Pretty much all the models agree that there should be a strong decrease under greenhouse gases increase, and um, why we don't see anything yet in the observation. So it's an attribution issue, and uh, what they've been um, uh, arguing for is that the internal variability associated with specific decadal variability may be um, masking the trend. And so we need long integrations and we need large ensembles to disentangle the internal variability component from the external force changes. And in order to show that, they have uh, used an ensemble of uh, CSM at low resolution um, that Clara Bezel and, and Matthew Long have been running. And what they've what they've been able to, to see using this ensemble is that indeed, if you take the trend um, between 1980 and 2014, depending on the how you you put the ensemble together, you can find some where the ants activity was particularly strong in favor of a mean event, or um, you know, 30 years where the uh, La Nina was more active. And you will get uh, differences in, in the trends in terms of delta T CO2. And uh, for example, the, whenever you have um, more um, simulations that have a larger number of, of um, positive and so positive El Ninos, you tend to have a trend that resembles more what the uh, CIMIT 5 models agree. Upon, but when you have lower um, ending activity, you then tend to have something that resembles more what has been observed for the last 30 years. Um, so in this case, the, um, really the demand is for long integrations and large ensembles. Um, high latitudes is instead the focus of the fourth contribution by Irina Marinova, Raffaele Bagnadello, and Jamie Palter. And they looked at uh, uh, summarizing present and projected variability at high latitudes and their impact on the carbon cycle. Um, Yanina and Jamie have been very active in also showing that most of the CIMIT-5 model uh, display a shutdown of uh, open ocean weather sea convection um, past 1980 in CIMIT-5. Mm, they are the, the goal of this contribution was trying to understand how the sun erosion in the North Atlantic carbon uptake and storage will respond to a changing climate. Um, so the challenges are in the representation of the export of deep water um, from continental shelves. We have very large uh, model biases in the level of sea, and this results in a realistic link between NAO and NOC. And then we have biases in the weather sea convection that affects sun erosion, the cable, and sometimes of variability because all the convection is essentially open ocean and, and it's not well represented. Um, the component of that is along the shelf and in polymers is not well represented in models. So we ended up with a very large intermodel spread for 
air, sea, CO2 fluxes, and anthropogenic carbon inventory, especially in the Thunder Ocean, where 40% of the exchanges happen. So it's a very large uncertainty overall. Um, so the recommendation goes in the direction of uh, sustained observation of biogeochemical cycles at high latitudes for a hierarchy of modeling approaches. Um, and especially for the standard ocean, we need also models of very high resolution because we need to figure it out what is the role of uh, the measure scale um, at those latitudes and for the carbon cycle especially. Uh, development and testing of parameterization um, that will allow to, to get in the model the correct transport of um, deep and bottom water from the shelf to the open ocean, and a comparison of uh, climate responses across high and low resolution models. And finally, the contribution that uh, Taka, myself, and Curtis put together is on the future of the Thunder Ocean carbon storage in CIMIT 5. And we, we want to stress again that the, uh, there is a very uh, substantial difference in the response of those models, even if their average, global average uptake of CO2 is more or less the same. Um, what we show in those figures is um, the CIMIT uh, 5 projected uptake of reformed carbon and of regenerated carbon across uh, nine models. Um, reformed carbon and regenerated carbon are not quantities that are necessarily saved by those models. So regenerated carbon is essentially calculated using alkalinity, and not all CIMIT-5 models have alkalinity saved either. That's why we are limited to those nine. And, um, and what you can see is that while there is a common trend to increase both the storage of regenerated carbon and the storage of reformed carbon in the Southern Ocean, the variability is pretty substantial between the models. And when you actually look to the right side, uh, you see the zonally and uh, vertically integrated annual mean regenerated carbon anomaly in those models across time you see that really there is a very large difference in the geographical distribution. And while there is some agreement in the sense that the high latitudes in the southern hemisphere will tend to store more regenerated carbon, um, the, the models really don't agree at all um, in, the, in the patterns, in the time at which this storage is going to increase, and on the amount of this increase across, across the globe. So the challenges that, um, that we um, put forward is try to quantify the relative contribution of physical and biological process, try to estimate the degree of nonlinearity of the interaction between processes. This is also very important. And understand regional expression and um, the intermodal differences of those regional expression, which are really large. So the recommendations um, are, again, to have passive traces like CFC and uh, SF6 to constrain the role of physical abaction and mixing, and to have a hierarchy of models which goes in the same direction of the previous um, contribution, and then run sensitivity experiments where we can perturb physical or biological states uh, in a controlled matter. And for this, really, um, the main issue is to have funding conduct these kind of sensitivity experiments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Annalisa. Um, we are now available to take questions. So if you have questions, um, feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you or type them in the chat box and we will also respond to those. Okay. 
I don't see any questions. Um, and with that, uh, let me thank Annalisa again. Um, I will share her email address if that's okay um, in my outgoing email so that you can follow up with her personally if you have any additional questions. Um, thank you for your very thorough presentation. Our next webinar, for those of you who will be joining us on the series, is um, Monday, June 13th, also at noon Eastern Standard Time. And it will be a presentation on the US AMOC science team. Thanks, everyone, and have a good afternoon. This is the end of our webinar. Thanks, Annalisa. Thanks.